So how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Uh, really busy. Um, I'm just gonna pull up the questions that you sent me. How are you? I am doing well. Okay, so let's start the interview. Sure. Um, Can you so, tell us about yourself? Um, yeah, so I was born in Tanzania and then I left Tanzania when I was 16. I moved to Malaysia and then I moved to Australia at the age of 19. Um, I took off my headscarf right before I moved to um, Australia, so I was about 18, 19. And yeah, so I come from a, um, I come from a Shia background. Um, the specific community is called the Koja Shia Ithnashari Jamaat. Um, I'm gonna make notes and send you anywhere while we're talking. Okay. So how old are you and when did you decide to start Faithless Hijabi? So I am 26 now. Um, and I started Faithless Hijabi last year. So I was 25 when I started Faithless Hijabi. Um, okay. In terms of the goals for our organization, it started off and it's still at its core remains a storytelling platform. We want to engage our audiences uh, by making them aware of the people living either in the Middle East who come from a Muslim background in the West, um, uh, girls who have escaped, girls who have uh, emancipated, girls who have run away from home, girls who have gone through emotional and physical abuse right, before leaving religion, after leaving religion. Sometimes those are the reasons that had caused them to question religion, the way they were treated um, being subservient to women, as to men, sorry. So um, the core of the organization and the goals is, so the goals are to encourage empathy by storytelling. Um, and our core principles um, for Faithless Hijabi is always keeping true to our um, audience by sharing the story that we've received. Um, and also, it's a global movement. So we have girls coming from everywhere. It could be from the Maldives. It could be from Canada. Um, some of them from Somalia, some of them from East Africa. Um, some, many of them from the Middle East, but also so many from the UK itself. Okay. And just, um, we also have converts and it's open to basically all ex-Muslims, but we've also had, um, We've also had curious Muslims as well who are like, I'm questioning, but I like the identity, but I don't believe in God. It's it's a very confusing phase for so many. So sometimes they take longer to even reach that stage. I've I've seen girls have taken a year and a half from when I first first spoke to them until now. Okay. So what motivated you to start this organization and who supported you when the organization was very young? So initially I started it with um, a Christian male friend of mine. Um, we had different goals, but in the end it ended up molding into what it is now. Initially we wanted to um, initially we wanted, we wanted to create a Sydney based group for people to question things but that didn't that wasn't safe for many people not many people would come out as curious muslims so we had to then narrow down our field to talk to people who had already come out so i've always been leading it i've had a few people help me with um the setups of it um registering the nonprofit, but i was motivated by my own experiences i wanted to know um, I wanted to know what other girls had gone through because I had gone through the same thing. Um, while I come from a very a relatively liberal family, um, I still felt very lost, but also found, I had found my new identity and I had to settle, and I was learning how to settle into it, but I also wanted to know, can women come together and help each other? Um, because we still go through a lot of security risks with the girls' stories that we get, um, a lot of girls are not comfortable talking to other people, so they'll talk to me or they'll talk to other volunteers, but it's always a one-on-one -on -one thing. 
Um, we couldn't actually create a community yet. We're working on it now to create a community. Uh, but what had motivated me was finding validation and, res and aligning what my story was to other stories. Because I'd heard of other ex-Muslim women like Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sarah Haider, and bits of their stories were the way I was thinking, but I didn't know how to confront it. And I could only imagine that there's so many girls like me who are going through the same things. And it only made sense to then reach out to women, ask them for their stories. And initially I would read my story, I would read the entire story on my own and publish it. So it was a one woman run organization until um, March this year. So for, from October to March, I was the only one running it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, it wasn't my full-time job. It was for, for parts of it was full-time, but most of it, it was done part-time while I had full-time employment. Okay. So were you scared or were you anxious when you just started the organization? And did you have any prior experience working in any non-government organization? No, I didn't. I I didn't. I didn't even know I was gonna. I didn't even know it was going to be this big. Um, I didn't know it would reach two thousand or three thousand likes. Um, I wasn't expecting it to. I just wanted a Facebook page that would connect people, that would be an advocacy. Um, I was really excited about it because I wanted so many women to just come together and share their stories, um, and also find a sense of. Um, a sense of community with sharing stories. Um, also, I think the the one thing that we always achieve after we've, you know, after we've received stories is that a lot of people has have never shared their stories before, so they find a lot of comfort, and it's it's like journaling for them. It is their experience, so there's nothing they're making up, but they haven't actually spoken about it to anyone before, and. That's what that's what we aim to achieve in the long term, giving women that safe haven or a safe space to share their story, um, having their stories be an advocacy um, for other ex-Muslim women or ex-Muslim women in general, but also on the other end, inspiring other people to come forward and talk about it. It all has to do with normalizing it. Why did you choose this name, Faithless Hijab? Um, because for the longest time, um, hijab for many, and knowing in Iran it's forced, but there's so many women who have been doubting hijab, not religion, just hijab. But we came up thinking, what if we, how do, how do we portray an ex-Muslim woman um, who is faithless but can't come out, right? And hijab felt like a good cover that where a lot of people who are questioning um, would still wear it because they're not sure yet. And hijab was that identification of Muslim women. But what happens when they're faithless? They're not Muslim women, but they're still hijabi. And they can be hijabis. And they could be faithless Muslims if you take Muslims as a um, cultural name. Do you put all your time behind Faithless Hijabi or do you work at other places? I have I have two other jobs. So um, on weekdays, I'm a programmatic analyst in a media agency. And on weekends, I work as a bartender. Oh, only because I'm trying to have more time outside um, Faithless Jujabi while growing it part-time. So Faithless Jujabi is very much part-time for me. Okay. What is your role at the organization? Um, my role in Faithless Jujabi is, well, besides founding it, I do the strategy part. So I'm a st strategic lead. Um, I'll decide on what campaigns we should put out, um, what conversation or conversation starters do we have, um, how to reach other women, um, 
what tech we should be investing in. Um, so I do pretty much the operations, the, the top level operations part of it and the tech part of it because I come from a technical background. And then we have a few volunteers who do the Arabic page of Instagram and the English page of Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. How many people volunteer for the organization? Um, at the moment, we're about four people. We're about four people. Um, we're trying to get more volunteers to come in, um, but we're in the process of actually establishing a better nonprofit structure. So um, looking for more experienced people who can help us drive it forward. Uh, all the girls who work at Faithless Hijabi are actually ex-Muslim women and real Faithless Hijabis as well, who wear a hijab but can't take it off. Do they all work full time? Um, they all work. Faithless Hijabi for many is on volunteer basis. We have no funding. We haven't decided to apply for funding because we're waiting on a better um, structure. We're waiting for more growth. Um, which will probably be happening in the next two, three months. So we just released our Arabic page about two, less than a month ago or a month ago. And that is still gaining traction slowly, but we plan to keep growing it. What is the outline of how the organization functions? So with Faithless Hijabi, we have we now have a website where women can submit stories, but previously I used to, because Faithless Hijabi was a large part of our growth was based on my growth as an activist. Um, and the more ex-Muslim women reached out to me, the more I would tell them to send me stories, the more I would start um, opening up Faithless Hijabi to all of them to send stories. But now that we have a website, um, whenever an ex-Muslim or anybody on my inbox comes along or somebody highlights an ex-Muslim tweet, I always just post the link and they will share their stories and it has pointers on um, what stories we're looking for, what pointers we have and anything else they would like to add. We want to keep it to free speech. Um, we want the girls to feel safe, so it's always anonymous. The stories come to us and then we and then I send it to the publishers that work with us with Faithless Javi. Girls that I have personally vetted, know them personally. Um, and they and because they're sensitive stories, um, the publishers will edit out if there are any typos or if the story needs to be in a particular structure or flowing. Um, and that's what happens in the English page. And in the Arabic page, we get translators to translate the story. So we have um, one of our volunteers is based in the Middle East, um, behind an identity because nobody can know who she is. And she helps us translate stories and she posts up and she takes care of the Arabic page. Um, only because we didn't want somebody who didn't know Arabic to just keep posting stories, but okay. no idea what they're writing about. So we want a form of authenticity. We don't want to automate it completely. Um, and we want our volunteers to be as engaged to then publish the stories to engage audiences as well. And what does a normal day at work look like for you? So with Faithless Hijabi, because I spend a couple of hours between my activism and Faithless Hijabi, I will do, depending on what work there is remaining, it could be finishing up the website, um, it could be, I personally, girls who come through Faithless Javi, I mentor them and coach them. It could be from coaching them on how to remove their hijab, even if they're Muslims, they'll come to me. Um, and even if they're ex-Muslims, they'll still come to me. Apparently, despite our difference in beliefs, they find comforting talking to somebody who's not going to push them to wear a hijab. So some of my days can be working with girls who have mental health issues, and most of them happen to be Muslims, or working with girls on helping them achieve better conversations or being comfortable with removing the hijab. And this could be girls from the age of 15 and above. Um, I 
my role is mainly to guide them to get their answers or to help them understand that being an ex-Muslim can come as a big burden to your families. And despite us wanting to accept it, we also need to accept that they, they would not accept it. That we need to learn to create better boundaries between us and our families. And that has personally worked for me. Um, on and off, sometimes even I fail to um, hold up that system of boundaries. But by large, I just have to coach girls into, well, one, being independent um, in their decisions, two, also being safe. Also, when they take those decisions, are they safe in their comfortable? So there's a lot of coaching and mentoring happening. And then there is um, the operation side that is happening as well. So it's right now we're looking for more volunteers to help us. But at the moment, um, I've been carrying a lot of different things that I need to do. According to you, what is the significance of a hijab? Well, I have never been, well, I, I don't think hijab has ever been a choice for, all, for any of us, really, who were born Muslims. We were told that hijab is what good Muslim women do. So we were, co we were coerced to wearing it. I thought I chose the hijab myself, but I didn't. But at this point, at this point in this day and age, a lot of the girls wear it as a political identity. They want to be recognized as Muslims. A lot of them don't even know how hijab, a lot of them don't even know how the hijab came about um, based on its history. They don't know a lot of the stories that what about hijab. They don't, they don't question why the hijab is there for women as clothing and not the same for men. Um, they've just learned to accept it. So I think at this point, hijab, the significance of hijab is mostly as a political identity. Did you first wear a hijab willingly? Um, I was eight and I chose, I, I thought I chose to wear it, but like I said, at a young age, I was always, I've, I've always seen Muslim women wear hijab until I was 16 and moved overseas. I didn't even know you could be a Muslim woman and wear hijab. So I think I would say I was coerced into wearing hijab. Um, it wasn't fully a informed choice of mine or an informed decision. But I did say I want to wear it. And my parents did not um, shy away from it. They accepted my decision because I was, I would have had to wear it when I was nine. I started when I was eight. When did you decide not to wear a hijab? I was about 18. I was about 18 when I decided I would take it off. But even before then, I started slowly loosening it up or showing my hair on the front. Um, I used to wear an abaya as well. So I took off the abaya and I'd just wear a headscarf. Um, and I think when I actually took it off, I was 18 turning 19. That was when you were in Australia, right? That was when I was in Malaysia about to go to Australia. Okay. What but, was your childhood like? Um, my childhood, well, I am one of six. So I have been brought up, My I have an oldest brother and then two older sisters and two younger sisters. So my sisters had already set the, pre, the precedence that they wore hijab and I had to wear hijab. But at the same time, I grew up in a very relatively liberal family. My, my family was happy to send me overseas um, for education, they did expect me to still be a Muslim. They did expect me to come back. But I think life just changed and I decided to go to Australia and they supported me. Um, so they've never been extremists. They've been conservative. Um, they're, they're, they've just been in their little bubble in Tanzania. They've never really, like they've traveled a lot, but they've never really experienced what it's like living in the West or even just progressive values in general. However, they were always, despite the passive aggressiveness, they've always been very, they've always been relatively kind to me. There's a bit of emotional blackmail now 
uh, knowing that I'm not a Muslim and I'm public uh, and, and a public activist, but they still talk to me. We're still amicable. Sometimes I just have to take a bit of space. But my childhood was relatively fine. It was never a reason why I left Islam. It was always that at the age of 14, I stopped praying. And my dad would tell me to keep praying, but he'd never really enforce it. He would just ask me and the guilt would drown me. Um, but when I moved overseas, I didn't really care much about prayers, about religion, even if I wore a hijab. It was never the forefront. I barely went to the mosque. So my family was never a reason why I rejected the religion. The more I studied about it, the more people I met who weren't religious, they they helped me question the religion in ways such as they were such kind people who were gay and I could never get myself to hate gay people. I could never reject them for their sexuality. I never really, I never really thought that they should be with a woman. So, and also the more I studied religion when I was trying to understand more about creating peace with gay people or creating peace with people who don't accept your religion more I was surprised that it didn't exist. What were the incidents that compelled you to step into helping other women? Um, I think ha going through mental health, like anxiety myself, and I remember calling my mom once and after I was diagnosed, eight, like, you know, five, six months after I was diagnosed with anxiety, um, I used to get panic attacks every night and I remember calling my mom and I asked and I told her mom I have anxiety and she's like you need to pray more and I started crying. I started crying and I said if you're not listening to me I have done everything and I was already an ex-Muslim I just didn't even know I tried playing the Quran on my phone it didn't help it just made me it just made me feel worse because I knew what the book like I knew a lot of what the book wasn't very peaceful and Having that experience, I started reading a lot of books outside of the Quran, be it on ATSF, psychological well-being, um, self-help. And once I got to a stage where I could take care of myself, um, I wanted to help other girls go. I wanted to help other girls who couldn't. Um, so many friends of mine, so many girls that I help are Muslims. They still choose to to be Muslims, but anxiety. And mental like anxiety and depression is something they suffer from so because i'd been through all of that i wanted to be a helping hand and i wanted girls to feel like they were never alone and religion had nothing to do with it i mean for me um a lot of my anxiety was tied into religion but my relationship with other people didn't have much to do with religion you describe yourself as an anti-theist right um, yeah, yeah, I do. Could you tell, tell us about the time when you were skeptical of your faith? Um, it started in phases. I was about 12 years old and 12 or 11 years old. And I went to Syria. And because I come from a religious background in Syria, you go, you go visit all the shrines. And I saw people praying to the shrines and kissing the shrines. And I'm like, I know it comforts people to be, to show love to a symbol, but why are they praying to it? And I could never understand. So I tried creating mental gymnastics in my head and I'm like, oh no, they still believe in Allah, but they're praying to it because they know that Allah was, like they know that this person was close to Allah. And then there were small things like who created God. And this was at a very young age. And as I grew up and I started questioning things about Shias and, and Sunnis, and I started learning more about Sunnis and only because I wanted to bridge the gap. And that from, a, I think from the age of 17 or 18, I only called myself a Muslim. So when people went like, are you a Shia or a Sunni? I'd say, no, I'm a Muslim. And that was slowly me trying to come out from those labels and making my own making my own destiny, I would, I would say, or choosing my own path versus what had been what I was born with. And then I critically started questioning it in 2016 when I was exposed to a lot of Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Ayan Hirsi Ali, and listening to their podcasts, 
it, I think a lot of it just made me anxious because I could relate to it, but I didn't know how to get there. Did that attract any violence or threat? I mean, just expressing myself as a supporter of gay people and a Muslim, I got a lot of abuse online. Um, I couldn't understand why people would hate them so much. Why would people hate anyone so much? So yeah, like even just as a curious Muslim, I got a lot of violence, but even now I get death threats. And I think you've probably seen my Twitter, my Instagram and Facebook with a lot, with a lot of threats with anything I do, um, even if it's not meant to be provocative, even if it's just a photo of me, everybody just wants to attack you on everything. I literally have people from Tanzania um, who knew that I suffered from a medical, um, who knew that I suffered from a health issue and they would always hold it against me every time. Um, so yeah, I do have people who intentionally would try bullying me. Does um, your organization, sorry, yes. Lucy. Does the organization provide help to ex Muslim female who are abused by their families or questioning? Yes, it does. Is their faith not even, not even in the question to offer help? No, usually, if you talk to anybody who is religious, they would not like, because apostasy is punishable by death, and because these are people who have been brought up with that ideology, the likelihood is that any questions they ask, the answer would be, don't question God, or you're interpreting it wrong, or maybe you should ask somebody who's a scholar. And then a lot of people, when they go to scholars, and even when I had, new, when I had recently come out, I was scared of going to scholars because I was so embarrassed of not being smart enough to know those answers. But there were logical fallacies. And a lot of the mental gymnastics are being played to keep you in the religion. So know your faith would not help you to um, in the questioning phase. Um, does the organization help Muslim men who are skeptical of their faith? The organization as such is built for women in their stories, but because I come as part of the organization, um, I, they're, they're very much intertwined, which is great because there are, while, while I have a political, I wouldn't say political, but while I have my activism as being an anti-theist, my organization serves purposes to engage women in critical thinking and be an advocacy for ex-Muslim women. Um, there is a bit of an overlap. But personally, yes, I do help ex-Muslim men or Muslim men who are thinking about it. A lot of times it ends up in abuse where I get harassed, I get abused. Um, <clears throat> I've had so many men who have tried harassing me and then would end up insulting me only because I tried questioning them or I would help them through it. And sometimes it would be fake and they would just waste my time. Um, and now I... I don't, because I would initially, when I came out, I was so willing to help other men, but it would blow up in my face. I find women to be, even if they're harsh when they begin with, um, they slowly warm up to the idea thinking, hey, you're actually not that bad. We may have different faiths and you offend me, but you're making some sense. And I would just ask them simple questions. With men, they find it easy to use sexual harassment instead of admit to them, to me challenging their critical thinking. But there are a few men that I have helped um, on and off. Um, a lot of them talk to all other activists. So I think in bits and places as ex-Muslim activists, we always help other people going through um, a similar phase. Do women from countries who live in those countries where Sharia is implemented, do they reach out for help? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we have um, we have a lot of Saudi women. Um, I actually helped a Saudi girl escape. It was from financial help to moral support, um, but she escaped and she's safe in the Western country, and that was pride and joy for me. Um, and yeah, we have a lot of women from like parts of Indonesia, parts of Malaysia, um, a lot of Middle Eastern women as well. 
will have reached out for help. And even so, even though they know nothing can be done off it, um, they've, they just want to talk sometimes and we talk about it. And I think in very little ways, me and my volunteers will try helping them. Sometimes they're forced marriages, even in Canada. Um, and that's not even Sharia law, but we'll try, we'll try providing as much support as we can. We don't have any financial help. So usually all the financial help comes in from crowd from crowdfunding. So that was the next question. Who supports Faithless Hijabi financially? I support it. I support it. I work two jobs to support anything that I can. Um, I stopped my career for since March last year. Um, I took a sabbatical, so I was traveling. I was sick for a bit. And then once I was recovering, um, I took some time out for Faithless Hijabi. Um, I had a lot of savings then, so I supported it in terms of registering it. A lot of my time spent online, um, even in the tech and everything, I've supported it fully with my savings. And that's why it means a lot to me and I've kept it really close and we haven't really gone into government funding because um, sometimes it's hard to justify where the money can go, especially if we're trying to crowdfund a, um, an air ticket, which could potentially be illegal. But I think moving forward, we want to come up with programs that would help ex-Muslim women in those situations, such as like in financial situations, which mostly to do with education, but help them get up to speed so they can be financially independent. And that's one of the things about leaving your religion. More often, you're ostracized from your family and cut out from any finances. So... We're hoping to apply for government grants, use part of their grants, part of the grants to award, to award ex um and help them get settled in, in their, in their new career path. It could be um, maybe paying part of their tuition or maybe helping them find a temporary accommodation. We're still discussing that. Um, so nothing as yet set in stone. What are the short-term and the long-term goals of the organization? So the short-term goals for now is um, translating our content um, and creating specific blog posts. So we should be releasing our blog posts next month-ish where we're still getting stories in. So our short-term goals are a lot about stories, uh, written articles, and um, reaching out to other ex-Muslim women. Uh, Long-term goals, the way I see Faithless Hijabi is um, working alongside with other ex-Muslim, um, other ex-Muslim organizations. But we would like to, we would like to specialize in helping women with, um, with their rights, with helping them encourage their rights. So I think in the long term, we're hoping that it will grow enough to be recognized globally um, and hopefully create, create an online community, which we have not yet stepped into only because we have a lot of admin to do before we can create that. So I think long-term goals would be actually creating a community of ex Muslim women. Are there any sister organizations of Faithless Hijabi outside the UK? So Faithless Hijab is actually registered in Australia as a charity, oh. um, only because I'm Australian and I'm temporarily in the UK until I get sponsored. But Faithless Hijab is a global movement, so we're mostly based online, regardless of it being set up in Australia. We're based online. We have women work. We have one person working from the Middle East. We have two of us working in the UK, one or two people working in Australia. So. That's the way we've been put up. But in terms of sister organizations, um, I would think parts of what we do resemble with a lot of organizations which are in the UK already based. A lot of other ex-Muslim organizations like XMNA, um, CEMB. Um, I help run the Australian ex-Muslim group as much as I can from being in distance. So the partner organizations are pretty much ex-Muslim um, organizations but also others that could coincide with um, 
the free from hijab movement. Um, I think a lot of what we do can partly resemble with many other organizations. We have tried to narrow down what we'd like to specialize in. What are the struggles of a Muslim woman in present day and age? Um, I think with being Muslim, there, there exists anti-Muslim bigotry, especially for hijabis. And while I don't personally endorse the hijab, I would never let anybody else um, be, I would never let anybody else be a subject for anti-Muslim bigotry. So I think at present, Muslim women, one, they either suffer with their identity crisis. Sorry, this is black. Um, they either suffer with identity crisis, especially in the West, where they've been told to wear a hijab. They're not sure of wearing the hijab. But at the same time, there, there is so much anti-Muslim bigotry in the West that it's one of these things that you hold so dear to yourself because everybody else doesn't want you to if that makes sense, because there's so many Muslim women being attacked, even I would stand up, especially for those women. And some, sometimes these people, sometimes a lot of girls will do it while wearing, by wearing the hijab, not while, by, but by wearing the hijab. So I think with Muslim women, there is a struggle to our identity issues. Um, also, being the subject of anti-Muslim bigotry is a big one, but a lot of it has to come down. Some girls that I help are actually victims of double standards in their family. So the boys would get different rights. The girls would get different rights. I never had to face that. But a lot of other girls actually have that as a main concern. What are the struggles of an ex-Muslim woman in present day and age? Um, a lot, actually. Um, one, there's ostracism and abuse. So while you're in your new identity, you're still really scared to be out there, whether whether out there means leaving home or whether out there means being online in public. So with how much as ex-Muslims are the min ex Muslims are the minority of the minority. We've been ostracized, we've been abused. We constantly get threats. We're constantly in the face of violence. We're in the face of being undermined. Um, our free speech is revoked. Um, and there's so many other struggles that we face as, as, as ex-Muslims as a whole. But with women, there is a lot of sexual harassment that comes into place. The moment you don't wear a hijab, and even if you're a Muslim woman that wears a hijab, you a Muslim woman that Sorry, a Muslim woman that doesn't wear a hijab, a Muslim woman will still be respected more than an ex-Muslim woman that doesn't that, that you could be wearing the same clothes. But because you left the faith, you're now in the light of being called a society slut. Like the modesty culture has depended on women forever. Right. So even if there are women who don't wear hijab, those women will attack ex-Muslim women for not wearing the same thing. But their response is at least I'm still a Muslim. Um, so I think, you know, harassment is a big thing and also being accepted in the society or being just even being accepted by your family is a big thing. And you lose out your friends and you lose, and, you know, there's a lot of mental, mental health issues that comes about it, um, especially because if you don't have any support while you're finding yourself, you tend to lose yourself even more because there's so much negativity associated with that. But I've only seen and heard from so many brave ex-Muslims who've been through hell and back. And despite being alone, they've stood up. They've, they've stood up, they've fallen, they've stood up, they've risen. And that's amazing to watch how strong all like, these women are. Previously, you have worked with Rahaf Muhammad, right? Sorry? Previously, you have worked with Rahaf Muhammad, right? I did work with Rahaf. So my role with Rahaf was a very, it wasn't like an aligned role. I was in the plane from London to, sorry, this one's up. I was in the plane from London to Sydney and somebody flagged, hey, there's a girl who's in Thailand and she's an ex-Muslim girl. And that was when Rahaf had just come out. And my role there was to make sure she was okay. 
And when she asked for help, I didn't know who to go to, but I looked at other people helping and I collaborated with them. And my role there was to make sure that as an ex-Muslim, she's being heard and that she's being safe. And if that involves um, contacting the UNHCR or contacting the government here or writing letters or working with people who are already helping her here, um, that's what my role encompassed, like putting pieces together. Um, I feel like her story was taken away by the media for being a Saudi woman who had ran, ran away from male guardianship laws versus being an apostate and a Saudi woman. So apostasy has just been erased from all of it. And her running away and, you know, when other ex-Muslims spoke about it, it shed a bit of light on the ex-Muslim as a ex-Muslim as a society, I guess, or ex-Muslim as a practice, like a practice of disbelief. Okay. What, what do you think are the hurdles around the globe about discussing the questions related to Islam? Um, I think there is a lot of um, political correctness. Um, even when people share their experiences, their experiences are mostly tarnished by um, a left, the regressive left, who name it as, oh, it's part of your culture, but it shouldn't be. A bad idea, whether it's in a culture or religion, should not be endorsed at all. So do you find more resistance from Muslims or Western non-Muslims when you criticize Islam? I, I find, I feel like ex-Muslims have been cornered by the right wing because they will take advantage of ex-Muslims um, to further their anti-Muslim bigotry. And the left wing would criticize ex-Muslims for speaking up about Islam or their experiences. And the Muslim right, who are like, the, Mus the Muslim right wing, who is more of the Salafi, very extremist practice, who would disregard you for ever being a Muslim because you didn't, because if you were ever a Muslim, you wouldn't have left. And the left who talk about um, them not being represented as real Muslims because they are not um, as extreme as the right wing. So there's in the Muslim world, there's always this question on who is the right Muslim. And that's why ex-Muslims, when they come out and they decide to criticize the scripture, each side will attack them saying, oh, but we're not homophobic, my sister is gay. Um, so I reject this first, but then the right wing will go like, no, you cannot be a homosexual. That's it. Like you, you just can't criticize that part of Islam because that God has made you that. God has made you to love women if you're a man. So I think the challenges come from um, the non-Muslim left and right wing and the Muslim left and right wing and ex-Muslims are the center of all of it. And they're abused even more by all of the sides and they're criticized as much. How do you cope with this? Um, I have I have pretty much, um, with the negativity that comes about, I've pretty much distanced myself. So in terms of the way I use social media, I will put up a post, put up a meme, turn off notifications, and then let it go. Um, sometimes I do tend to engage, but it's also reminding myself that I'm only going down a rabbit hole and there's no real outcome to all of that. Sorry, one sec. Yeah. And that there's no real outcome to all of that and that I should, I should speak to people who I can, where I can make changes and, um, let go of those who are just beyond changes. Um, just recently I posted up the Allies Gay photo and I had a lot of backlash and not for a lot of celebrities, some celebrities to tweet about. Um, but at the same time, I had women who came up to me and she's like, look, if you have any questions about Islam, I'm happy to answer, but I don't like your post. And I'm like, I am an ex-Muslim. I've studied Islam for a long time. What makes you think that I have questions? I don't. I've never, I've never asked a question like that since I've come out. I'm quite happy with my decision. And another girl came out to me, started swearing at me. And then I was like, look, the only person who's being disrespectful in this discourse is you. All I've done is stated my views. I'm not swearing at you. And she in response saying, 
Sheen responds and said, your dad is gay. And I'm like, that's okay. I'll still love him. It doesn't matter. What, like, you know, gay people to me are not a threat or a disgust. I don't really care. Um, and, you know, and then she's like, you seem like a nice person. Stop offending people. And I'm like, think about it. Why are you offended? Right. Every time I say, every time I ask this question, people are like, "But he's my God," and I'm like, "Yes." And if you know your scripture, then you should know that there are so many things about your scripture that even you would disagree with. And they're like, "Yeah, but you know, you could you could see there, you could see the wheels turning." So I have I have tried sometimes, mostly with women, uh, talking to my abusers. So um, it's like confronting my abusers on why they hate me. Um, and that that engagement gives me more satisfaction than engaging in somebody in a rabbit hole. Does the internalized misogyny in Islam pose a significant threat to others? Um, well, apart from what's already out there, it's just a matter of the ones who practice it. So there are a percentage, a very small percentage of people who are fundamentalists and then they're conservative and then they're liberals. The ones that we fear the most are conservatives or extreme, sorry, not conservatives, they're extremists who would literally take the word of God and act upon it. And there are definitely some parts of Islam that a lot of liberals would also disagree with, homophobia being one of them, um, unequal rights for women being another, and also just um, like the killing of non-believers, polytheists, um, or something that has happened in history that has been substantiated by, oh, it was defense. But ISIS seems to take that word literally. They would also kill Muslims who are liberal. So it looks like the whole, like Islam in itself has been destructive to itself. And their practices have been destructive to the world as compared to a secular world. You recently attended the London Pride where you posed with the sign Allah is gay. Did you carry that sign or did you just pose? I only posed with it, so I didn't go for the march. I couldn't make it to the march. I was not feeling well, but I only posed with it. I did, however, see them pass by and there were a lot of people who were cheering for those who were in it. I felt really proud to have known those people because it's brave. Um, and I didn't think my photo would go viral. I did, really did not expect um, so much negativity to come about it. I'm hoping that in a few days it will shut down, but it looks like there is still so much going on. So I've just turned off notification. But I think for the most part, there weren't many, there weren't any Muslims out there that I could see, nobody in a headscarf that I could see. Um, so most of the people out there were just like happy. They were just happy for them. They're like, they don't really care. They just want more acceptance. People were just there to be happy. But I think it was one of those very few days where I didn't see a lot of Muslims in the city. What would you say about that sign? Being an entity theist and then saying Allah is gay, that will... It's it just as, fit as well. contradictory as it sounds, as contradictory as it sounds, if you if you think about it, in your narrative, if, if somebody who's a theist who accepts Allah as being a God, their God or one of the gods, right? Um, him being gay would only be offensive if you're homophobic, right? Had I said Allah is not gay, nobody would have that dissent. Or say if Allah is straight, nobody would really care, would they? So it's it's it. I think it, this highlights the the negativity that is being associated with being gay. Um, as a person who doesn't believe, and when I read that, I could have said Peter Pan is gay, and because it doesn't exist, it doesn't matter to me. It could be a figment of my imagination. So the idea for that was one, to normalize that being gay is okay. I don't understand, no, I think I understand why people have taken it in a very crude way, but it's also because they cannot comprehend that being gay is okay. 
um, while while I know it has provoked a lot of people, the idea, I, the, the way people have responded to it. Now I have a few Muslim friends who are like, I don't really care if you say Allah is gay. He could be, he could be not, I don't know, right? So I have had Muslim friends respond to it. And I was like, very few people think like that. See, like now I know that you're a peaceful person, right? Um, and, the way the majority of the people have responded have just highlighted that despite Jesus being queer as a poster, Allah being gay had more of an outrage. It had a lot of an outrage. And it just highlights the domination that Islam has over other religion and why if we had to rank as one of the most dangerous ideology, Islam would take the rank. Um, and it has a lot to do with its political identity in, the land, in this landscape, you know, taking dominance over other religion. And while there is an increased rate of birth rate, there's also an increased rate of extremism and terrorist activities that come about um, Islamic terrorism. What are the recurring insults you have received because of your volunteer work and your stance against Islam? Um, a lot of them have to do with sexual harassment from the way I look to my hair to my orientation, so I'm straight, but because I'm a supporter of the LGBT, because I'm an ally of the LGBT community, I have been called a lot of different names. Um, a lot of a lot of it has to do with the way I look, which doesn't really affect me because I like the way I look. But most of it has to do with calling me a bitch, calling me a slut, like all the negative connotations. You can you can. Um, you can associate a woman with so yeah it's a lot of sexual harassment like 90 percent of it is sexual harassment what would you suggest other fellow ex-muslims to cope with it um i think it is important to have a healthy balance with social media to help a healthy relationship understand when your body is rejecting psychologically um yeah, so understand when your body is psychologically re uh, rejecting the negativity. And once it does that, or once you see yourself getting into a Twitter fight or Instagram fight, you shut it and that's it. So having a healthy relationship with social media. Um, also being less affected by what people think of you. If you truly think you're doing the right thing, take feedback only from those people who you would seek advice from. Um, and that doesn't mean everybody in the world. Um, that could possibly mean just your close friend. So don't let what other people think of you bring you down. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's how I would see it. How does the PC culture affect important discussions about Islam? Um, I think a lot of people a lot of people have a lot of a lot of the left have tried to regress our voices because it is offensive to one's culture or religion but they don't take it by the subject matter they have found it difficult to be objective in um in our arguments and that has affected so many from raising their voices but that has also brought many together to raise their voices. And because the left is being really regressive, a lot of the attention that ex-Muslims uh, ex get is from the right wing instead of those who can be center and objective about things. Um, I feel like a lot of ex-Muslims have been taken advantage of by the right wing. That is one of the, um, that is one of the negativity that comes out of it because we're then being used to fuel anti-Muslim bigotry um, as an example, but it's also because I, I think, I think the left not giving us a platform to talk about it and always continuing to shut us down is only, it's, it's only highlighting the bigotry that they hold. Um, it is an encouragement of bad ideas. Intersectional feminism is probably the worst thing that has happened to us as Muslim women or ex-Muslim women, where we are being held by a different standards for feminism, um, where we don't get the right 
where we where we don't get the same rights for feminism and situations like Iran and Saudi Arabia are examples of it when Western left when the Western lefties do not fight for women in Saudi Arabia they're still always under the precaution oh but it's their culture they're allowed to do it however if the same rules laws apply to their country they will be totally against it it feels like they've been projecting a lot of bigotry which impacts us as ex-Muslims to be critical of because we're labeled bigots or we're labeled Islamophobes or Zionists or a Zionist supporter. So we've been given this title that we don't even hold to put us down. And that sometimes can put a lot of people in a position to not talk anymore. Can you shed light on Islamophobia and Muslim phobia? <laughs> so I think Islamophobia is a made up term and it is a term that stops conversation or dialogue about Islam in general. Any, any of those that doesn't share Islam in, the, in a good light, um, it stops any criticism of an ideology because it gives it a special privilege to not be criticized, which is really unfair. Sorry. Um, which is really unfair. And um, there is no other religion that has a phobia attached to it. So it makes you think why, it's, why Islam is the only one that has it. Um, I don't like the definition of Islamophobia, which is prejudice against Muslim and Islam. People have every right to, dis people have every right to disagree with an idea. People have every right to, dis to um, criticize an idea but you can't treat human beings with any less dignity. And that's where I feel like the word needs to be replaced with anti-Muslim bigotry. Um, I have a Muslim family myself, so I would, only, I would only talk about things that I genuinely know that if this was told to my Muslim family, they wouldn't be the happy, they would feel insulted, right? If they're legit concerns about them being ill-treated like I've read a lot of I've read a lot of um, far rights talk about we don't need any Muslims here Muslims should just go back to where they came from and that's a no um, but if they say we don't need Sharia law I would agree with that that we don't need Islamic law to run our country I would agree with that nobody needs it a lot of Muslims would also disagree with it how does anti-Muslim bigotry affect ex-Muslims Anti-Muslim bigotry, sorry? How does anti-Muslim bigotry affect non-Muslims or ex-Muslims? <clears throat> um, I think to me personally, anti-Muslim bigotry, well, bigotry or extremism of any form is unhealthy. It is a violation of people's civil rights. It is, a, it is treating a human being less than what you would treat others. The way it affects us is because we're, the more we encourage it, the more we're encouraging a world of um, violence, the more we're encouraging a world of abuse. And I am personally affected because I still have Muslim friends and family and I don't hold any prejudice against people who practice a faith in their homes. Um, I would, I have no problem with people practicing it at their, in their homes, provided it doesn't affect the world outside or the public or in the public sphere. But anti-Muslim bigotry, I think to me, I'm always reminded of what if my family were in that situation? What if they were told, go back to where you came from? Um, I think every person who values people's rights should be fighting against anti-Muslim bigotry. Um, and that doesn't mean that you have to allow the ideas that are bad for humankind to flow. It's important to segregate them. And there is, it is definitely hard to do it when um, you, don't want those, that, you don't want those ideas that you're criticizing impact the people that follow it because they have been, for the most part, many of them have not read their books. Many of them do not know why they're in the religion except for they were born in it. Um, I would like to think that people are better than ideas like that, but a lot of them have never been given that 
opportunity to question it, to either leave or to become better people despite following the spiritual path of Islam. I feel like the political part of Islam always takes dominance over a lot of fundamentalist and conservative Muslims. What do you think of the burqa bans that countries like France are pushing forward, citing the secular beliefs? Um, I'm not a particular fan of bans that are involved, bans that contain, bans that aim to police a woman's body. But in terms of the burqa ban, um, there are two sides to look at it. And this is a more centrist position. One, we're doing the same thing, which is, policing a woman's body by not having them wear it. And two, in the name of in the name of security, yes, the ban is very applicable, but it's really hard to have a position that can be both right to me and still um, not project the contradiction that I always have. Um, while I come while I am optimistic about it, that I feel like I can help women come out of wearing the hijab, it's still a future that I don't see happening. So with burqa ban, I guess I'm mostly in for it. And I accept that there does uh, project a security risk when you cover your face. So no face covering should be allowed of any form. Um, and it shouldn't be targeted to just the burqa because it does project, again, anti-Muslim bigotry. But any masks or anything that in, in the public should be banned if it's for security. Um, at the same time, it, when you think about it, there's so many girls that I have spoken to had worn the burqa unwillingly at the age of 10 or 11. They didn't choose to wear it. That, that kid is in grade five or six. Like they, they don't know what's happening. So in a way, that it's quite, that it's quite good that a country in Sweden um, are voting to create a bill that kids under, I think under 18 or 16 should not be wearing the burqa. Well, last Friday, Tunisian Prime Minister signed a decree banning niqab. Are yeah. you aware of that? Um, what Prime Minister? Tunisian Prime Minister. Um, I don't know much about Tunisia, to be honest. I only know that there was a gay, I think, member of parliament voting to become a president, but I don't know much about the burqa ban. Well, as it happened on June 27, there were two suicide bombings in the capital. Right. And I witnesses said that the suicide bomber was wearing a niqab and hence they went for a niqab ban in public institutions. Well, this is again an example of they actually have, they actually have data and people that are actually doing acts in, you know, in like the burqa ban. So I think it's it's a good thing because right now they actually have those data to support the burqa ban. Um, but yeah, interesting. I didn't know about it. I'm just reading it up now. So, do you find security reason as a valid reason to impose such bans? Yeah, absolutely. Bad ideas are bad ideas. It's just like FGM. I'm not comparing the burqa to FGM in a way, but like just in light of what bad ideas are, FGM is bad. Although some people do find it good and religious and halal and everything, it is still a bad idea and we should take it as such. If the burqa, has a negative consequence in a country where it is likely to get terrorist attack by women wearing burqa. And now they've also had um, security concerns for it. I think that's a valid reason for it. How can the situation for an ex-Muslim be improved around the globe? Um, I think having ex-Muslims speak more, defend our rights to speak, because a lot of time we are always in the face of criticism. Defending their rights to speak is one good thing. Um, having the left explore what option, how we can further help to create a better world. I feel like in the end, we want a better world. If that means to criticize bad ideas, then we need to work together to criticize bad ideas, regardless of whose religious feelings it affects. I think it's important to put 
tangible outcomes in the face of those bad ideas? What happens if we don't talk about this idea? What happens if we continue to have extremist groups in our country? Um, or how can we improve the outlook of the people um, who are, you know, who are subjected to FGM, who are subjected to forced hijab? Forced hijab is again policing a woman's body, people who don't want to wear it, some people who want to wear it think it should be a choice, even though, like, essentially, I don't think it was ever a choice, but the only way we can counter this is by educating women to get their rights. So I think ex-Muslims movement can drastically improve when we have more awareness, um, more exposure to different platforms. Um, I think even just normalizing that it's okay to leave, it's okay to come out and providing, you know, having laws that criminalize um, apostasy, countering those laws of those countries is already a great help for many ex-Muslims because the ex movement is on the rise, mostly because it is criminalized. You always, you face a lot of abuse, ostracism. It's never been easy for any of us to leave. I don't know one Muslim who has found it, ex-Muslim who has found it easy to leave. There always comes a lot of either like a mental, um, a mental trauma with just you accepting that, hey, you were born as a Muslim or you used to believe that homosexuality is um, bad and that you hated gay people it's really hard to come to another place where you're like you know what this is what the new world is like I am constantly learning I'm constantly unpacking things it's reforming our religion going to do any good um I don't think Islam can ever be reformed one reason being the polit the politics involved in Islam and the fact that the book the Quran is a literal word of God and the Sunnah is the practices of Muhammad that are valid in this in the time that he was um, alive and every time. I don't think it can ever be reformed. I think people reform, people progress, people reject ideas. Um, I don't think there will be a Quran 2.0. So I don't see it as a possibility for reforming at all. However, I am going to support those liberal Muslims and reformers into fighting to create a better world. But I personally don't see it reforming. Do I think there's a need to reform? If there was a possibility, yes, it would be great to have all the bad ideas. But even with Christianity, a lot of it has not reformed. Homosexuality, as we know it, is still is still looked down upon. Misogyny still exists. I feel like a lot of the Abrahamic religion have despite evolving and despite having Islam present, which takes up the lead in domination, a lot of them are still not equal to women's rights. You know, any good Christian, like any practicing conservative Christian household would have different, um, different standards for their girls and the boys. And um, I mentioned homosexuality as a big thing only because it was pride that came up. But there's a lot of homophobia going on in Twitter since London Pride. It's not only coming from the Muslims, it's coming from Christians as well, a lot of it. So the thing is, a lot of people don't, a lot of people will criticize Christianity for it, but they won't say anything about Islam for it because, you know, how could you talk about a religion? Of, how could you talk about the religion of Islam? It's always shunned down. Every voice, like we discussed earlier, has always been, um, regressed. What are some of the books you would suggest others to read? The first book that I read was The Atheist Muslim by Ali Rizvi, who's a friend of mine. Um, I really like that book. There was so much as a Shia and him being a Shia um, I could relate to. And the moral landscape is pretty good. I only read it halfway, but I really like Sam Harris. I like the way he constructs an argument and I like the way he talks about it. Um, and hmm, I have a list. Uh, Majid Nawaz is a good person to follow for a more reformist point of view. I find his ideas to be very balanced um, despite being a Muslim himself. I find him to be more welcoming to ex-Muslims. Um, 
Richard Dawkins can be somebody who is somebody not not for curious Muslims, but those who have already come out. It's a very good it's a very good book to kind of fathom how God is an illusion. Um, yeah, and then the other books I read had a lot to do with um, evolution, Hamadeus, um, understanding the world from a different lens. Uh, I read Guns, Germs, and Steel, but I guess I would suggest The Atheist Muslim, uh, Why There Is No God by Armin Nawabi, and um, Sam Harris's Moral Landscape and um, Richard Dawkins' God Delusion. Just to be on the same page, I think maybe you misheard the question. It was almost a similar one. What are some of the books you would suggest others to read? The question was, what are some of the books you would suggest others to read? Who are the others we're talking about? Like any other person who's skeptical of their faith or in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, Atheist Muslim by Ali Rizvi is good for Muslims. He talks about his thought process. Um, Why There Is No God by Armin Ababi. Um, Moral Landscape by Sam Harris. I'm currently reading Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker. Um, and God Delusion. Is there anything else you would like to add? Um, not really. Um, feel free to send me a transcript and I can read through it. OK, sure, sure. It was nice talking to you. And likewise. But are you the same one on Twitter? Yes. Ah, oh, perfect. I like your views. You're much, you're much kinder than I am. I'm at the stage where I'm like, this is my view. This is what I am. This is how less I care. OK. I, I would really, I think at, some, at some point when I do have time, I'll probably message you. And I'll, I, I really, I'm really trying to put arguments together from like other different Hindus on like misogyny in the caste system, um, only because I really want to know more about different religions. Like I know a lot about Christianity now, um, but yeah, I always want to put arguments forward. Um, but yeah, I'll probably, hopefully in the next month when I have a bit more time, because I just started this job. I have a lot to do. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, what? I say thank you so much. Have a lovely evening, night, night, cheese. Yeah, it's 12.30 here. Thank you. Thank you for taking out the time and accommodating to my thank time. Thank you for agreeing for the interview. No worries. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.